Thank you for downloading or streaming this message from Emmanuel Church. We are one church with multiple locations, and we believe God wants to bless you right where you are. In a few moments, you're going to hear some practical teaching from God's Word that I believe will be inspiring and relevant to your life. First, though, if you haven't yet experienced Emmanuel Live, we encourage you to go to our website, eclife.org, to check out our service times and locations so that you can experience Emmanuel in person or through our online campus. If this message blesses you and you'd like to support the ministry financially, again, you can go to eclife.org and click on the Giving tab and choose Online Campus as your campus. Thanks again for joining us today, and we hope this message will be an encouragement to you on your spiritual journey. Well, good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel. We're glad that you're with us. Why don't you stand to your feet? We're going to sing a few songs to worship our God today. Just a second. 
My name is Ashley. I'm one of the pastors here, and I am honored that I get to be with you guys this morning. I want to give a warm welcome to anybody who is new here to Emmanuel. We're so glad that you're our guest this morning. Uh, if you were able to make it to our new here kiosk, I want to invite you to fill out a connection card before you leave and take it to one of those kiosks because we have a special gift for you for being our guest this morning. Again, we're so glad that you decided to join us. But I want to give a warm welcome to everybody here that's at our group. Greenwood campus. You guys are at our broadcast campus. And what that means is the things that we see and hear and experience here in this room are being showed to our microsites, our multi-sites, and on our online campus where people are tuning in all over the world, which is really incredible. But we need your help with something. We want to make sure that everyone again here and tuning in have an excellent experience. And so I would humbly ask that if you have kiddos in service with you today, if they get a little bit excited or even sad, that you would quickly step into the one of the environments that we've designed just for them. Whether that be our nursing mom's room, our family room, or our children's ministry that goes all the way up through sixth grade, we've thought of them when designing those environments. And we want them to have an excellent experience this morning too, not just you guys, the people around you, and those tuning in. Like I said, we have an amazing morning planned. And again, we've had it with you guys in mind. We're gonna continue worshiping here in just a few moments. Um, and then we get to continue worshiping through um, an opportunity to give back to God because he's given us everything. And then we're in for a treat today because we're starting a brand new two week series called The Perfect Family, where we get to hear not just from Pastor Danny, but we also get to hear from Jackie as well. And if you're not excited about that yet, you should be. Oh yeah, I hear you guys getting excited about that. Yeah, I love it. If you're not excited, you have a couple more minutes to get excited because you should be. It's going to be really amazing. And I think no matter who you are here today, um, it's going to be a blessing to you. Um, well, like I said, we're going to stand to our feet in just a minute to worship. But before we do, I got to ask, how many of you have been to one of our night of worships before? Let me see. If, oh, okay. That's great. Yep. I was gonna say, let me hear you, but you already let me hear you. Um, you guys know how amazing it is. And if you haven't been to one of our night of worships, that kind of gives you a glimpse at to what you've been missing out on. And I don't want you to miss our next one coming up March 18th, that's a Wednesday. And what this is, is an opportunity for um, all of our campuses to come together here in this auditorium for some time to focus and, and pause and reflect and celebrate um, who our God is and even get our hearts ready for the Easter um, season that's coming right around the corner after that and so you might have questions about what if I have kids or what time do I need to be here and all those questions can be answered if you head to the website eclife.org you should, can check it out for more info there and all this talk about night of worship probably is getting you excited to continue worshiping today so I'll invite you to stand back to your feet as we sing together this song to you guys last week. It really just reminds us, it encourages us that there's nothing that our God can't do. There's nothing too big for Him, too small for Him to handle. So as you get a hold of it, we just want to encourage you to sing it out with us. Just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, darkness has to retreat just one touch I feel the presence of heaven just one touch my eyes were open to see my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that our God can't do there's not a mountain that
power like the power of Jesus. So let faith arise and let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Now we believe for greater things. There's no power like God has done so much for us and he's promised to do so much more than we can ever ask for or even imagine. And what's really amazing to me is that God is continuing to work in us and through us. And it's not because of something that we've done, nothing on our own power, but it's because God is that good and that he loves us and he's kind to us and he's good. And you know, we get the opportunity to respond in worship because of that goodness. And you know, ultimately it's because of the cross of Jesus, what he did on the cross for us by dying for our sins, that we get to experience his kindness and goodness and grace and mercy and love for us and get to have that relationship with him. And so as we respond this morning, let's just respond with a posture of thankfulness and gratitude for who Jesus is and what he's done for us. I know I'm thankful for that and I hope you are too. So as we sing, Let's have that posture together.
to Christ and grow in Christ so they can experience God's goodness um, with the relationship with Him and His goodness throughout their time here on this earth. And, and I just wanna share a story with you guys today about a friend um, who told us a little bit about her story of how she came to Christ and grew in Christ. So I'm excited to share this with you today. She said this, since around five years ago, I've looked for a church that I could call home. And I'll be honest, I was terrified of Emmanuel because it was so large. I had a feeling that I would never be able to connect like I wanted to. A very good friend of mine invited me to Emmanuel for the first time and I fell in love. I couldn't put my finger on it, but I had an amazing feeling. My friend asked me to be a part of a small group. My first day at a brand new church and I'm already invited to something. I finally feel at home after searching many years, and now I'm overwhelmed with love from strangers that I've never even met. What an amazing feeling it is to be so overwhelmed, not just with information, but with people who truly love, appreciate, and care for me to inspire me to follow God's word and path. Thank you, Emmanuel, so much. And we can celebrate God today for that because that's just really exciting, really encouraging. I know, come on. Amen, amen. And I'm so 
so thankful we get to we get to share her story today because there's so many of you out there that have a story similar to that. And I gotta say thank you to you guys for being a part of creating an environment where people feel loved and appreciated and cared for. But I gotta give a special thank you to those of you that partner with us financially, those of you that give generously to God through Emmanuel. Because of your generosity, environments like this and our multi-sites and our microsites are created for people to come and experience how good God really is. And so I just wanna take a minute to invite those of you that don't partner with us partner with us financially to join us today. And again, be a part of what God is doing in and through Emmanuel, not just here uh, locally in Greenwood, Indiana, but globally all over the world as well. There's a lot of different ways that you can partner with us. There's a giving kiosk out in the lobby. The offering buckets are gonna be passed here in just a few moments. You can head to our app if you would like to. Um, you can take your phone out and even text the word give to 65248. That's how my family does it. It's super Super easy we're super thankful for that you can also head to our website if you'd like as well so there's so many different options whatever you feel most comfortable with and again I just want to extend the invitation for you to be a part of what God is doing in and through Emmanuel would you pray with me then we'll continue on with service together Jesus thank you so much for today and I thank you for another opportunity to give back to you. And God, I pray that we give today, believing and trusting that you're gonna do something miraculous with this little piece of what you've given us here on this earth and, and multiplying it in ways to make an impact, an eternal impact on this world that we again get to be a part of. God, we trust you and believe you that you're doing amazing things and we extend gratitude saying thank you that we get to be a part of it. God, I thank you for this church and I thank you for um, the leaders of it that we get to hear from them today. God, you've given them a word um, and I pray that we, no matter who we are today listening, are ready to, to to receive something from you today. God, we love you so much. It's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, Emmanuel. How are you feeling today? <laughs> Welcome, Greenwood. Welcome, Vanta. Welcome, Franklin. Welcome, Garfield Park. Welcome to our online campus. Welcome, Theodora House and also the Johnson County Work Release. Welcome to all of our locations. I'm so excited today. We're starting a brand new series called The Perfect Family. And I'm even more excited about this series because my better half, Jackie Anderson, my wife, is with us here. Give it up for her. Thank you for joining. This is the, the, the thing that she loves to do the most, is to get up and speak in front of people. So I finally caved in and said, fine, you can come on stage with me. Uh, no, that's, that's not true. Um, but uh, I do thank you for being up here with us. And so we are going to be talking for the next two weeks about all things family related and raising children and all that fun stuff. And we've done this before and talked about marriage, relationship stuff, dynamics, but we've never actually talked about Family, family stuff. And so um, we're just going to kind of pour out our cup and share with you what, what we've been experiencing over the last 18 years. We've been parents now, been married for 20. Um, and we are not professionals by any means. We do not have PhDs in childhood psychology, uh, but we are in the trenches with those of you raising kids. How many of you are raising kids at all of our campuses? Raise your hand. Wow. Okay. Okay. So there's a lot of us. I know some of us are fostering. A lot of us have blended families. Uh, I know that many of us uh, were past the, the stage where we're parenting children, uh, but we can still hear, maybe hear some things today that we can pass on to others, maybe your kids who are now raising your grandkids. And I do know that uh, there are some grandparents here uh, who are raising their grandkids. And so even if you have no plans on having a family in the future and you're a middle school student or high school student, you're not thinking about this stuff, uh, or if you're an adult and you're not planning on bringing children to the world, I think you'll, uh, you'll have some fun just looking into our crazy lives and uh, I think it'll be interesting to you, if nothing else. Um, and so we're excited to be here. And uh, the perfect family, that's what we, uh, we, taught, we titled this series because Jackie and I absolutely have the perfect family. Um, <laughs> And if you believe that one, I'll tell you another. But uh, why don't you talk about what, what the perceived perfect family looks like? 
Yeah, well, first, first of all, thank you for having me up here for two weeks. Um, it's been fun so far to share the platform with you. So we got one more after this, It'll, and hopefully that'll be fun. You're the also. best. You're the best. Uh, so I, if, when I think a perfect family, I think Instagram perfect. You know, everyone has matching clothes. The kids' faces are never dirty. They never have a messy house. They ne their kids never disobey. They never argue. They never eat processed food. You know, this, this is the perfect family. And they always put their shoes away, no matter what. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, but that isn't our family. Um, <laughs> we have a real family. And just to kind of pull back the curtain and give you an idea, uh, the, uh, the real family uh, might have, like if you went into their house, everything is like total chaos right now. There's no less than five unfolded clean baskets of laundry. Uh, people miss the bus because they cannot find matching socks in the morning. That happens in a real family. Um, and you, when the laundry is unfolded, you hope, you hope it's clean. I mean, sometimes you dump out a basket and you're like, wait a second. You, have you to start smell folding it, it yeah, and it's like, it I don't think this got washed. <laughs> that, that happens. Um, the real family might actually even get an anonymous letter from a neighbor complaining about the barking of their dogs. Yeah, so that happened this week, and um, <laughs> seriously, so if you are our neighbor and you sent that letter, we are sorry. Really we sorry. are new dog owners, and we're trying to figure out how to stop them from barking. Um, yeah. yeah, but... <clears throat> Our family isn't perfect, but we do love our family. We think they're pretty great. Here's a picture of them. It's going to pop up. Yep. And so this is our family. We took this picture after uh, our son's team won the county tournament, which was an, an awesome day for us. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Andrew is our oldest there. He's in the, the blue track suit. He's 18. He's a senior. I can't believe he's a senior. Getting ready to graduate and, and move on uh, to bigger and better things. He plays varsity basketball. And I'm not lying when I tell you the whole family has really enjoyed supporting him this season. It's been a fun time for us. Bo is our 16-year-old. He uh, just got his driver's license. So that has been fun and interesting and scary. <laughs> and... Uh, he works at Chick-fil-A, so we all love getting some extra God's chicken when he yes. comes home from work, maybe bring, brings dinner home with him. He had great leadership training there, so we're, we're very thankful for that. Uh, and he enjoys club sports at his high school. And Ruby, she's 14. She's a freshman, and she is in show choir. Uh, so I'm loving that. I think she's loving that, too. And she also loves theater and drama, so she musicals and stage drama, all of those things. That's where you'll find her. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. My wife has, has put up with the sports, the sports and the sports and the sports for all these years. And now, finally, it's makeup and hair and dancing and singing. And Sequins. she is really having a good time. Mm -hmm. Yes, very much. The jazz hands come back, yeah. you know. Uh, no, so, uh, but when they approached us to do this two-week series on family, you know, marriage is something different. We've been at it for 20 years, and we feel like we have a good marriage, um, and we're, we're, you know, every day still working on that. But with family, we're still very much in process. <laughs> and I'm, I was kind of like, R are you sure you want us to talk about it? Because we're not done yet. You know, mm -hmm. if our family is a cake that we're baking, give us about eight to ten more years and then check back with us and then you will see if what we actually did worked. <laughs> uh, I think we, we have a measure of success but we're definitely still very much in process still fleshing out these principles and uh, still working on uh, the fam learning how to parent. Yeah so again we're just going to kind of share some things with you uh, some ingredients that we're kind of cooking with. We're, we, we're probably missing some ingredients so uh, by you know by all means if you want to help us maybe send us an email or two say hey you know try this or that. We're, 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 we're students she's always reading books we're always listening to podcasts and trying to learn how to become uh, better at doing family stuff. So I'll give you, I'll start with our definition of what we kind of understand parenting is all about. This isn't really from a book or for even directly from the Bible, although I believe its roots are in the scripture. It's just something that we came up with to shoot for as a goal for our parenting. And it's, you don't have to, it's not in your notes. We actually left you a blank piece of paper there so you can write down whatever you want. Uh, you don't have to write this down for sure. But here's kind of our goal as, as parents. And that's to develop children into adults who are self sustaining and who are able to bless others. And I'll break this down for you really quick. 
Self-sustaining simply means that when it's time for you to leave, you leave. Like, you, you don't sleep in the basement, you know, you don't stay at mom's house. Uh, you can take care of yourself, you can get a job, you can do, you know, and you can launch. And see, the goal of our parenting ho- has always been, let's help the children to spread their wings and get out of here. Like, you know, so, so that, not in a negative way, but we just believe that our parenting has a window and it's going to come to an end, at least the, the you know, the childbearing uh, years. And so we want them to be self-sustaining uh, and not live in the basement and then also be able to bless others, which means that they're going to have to overcome their narcissism, their selfishness. Uh, We believe with all of our heart that healthy relationships are built by people who are able to think of others, not just themselves. And Jesus was a person who, I mean, he, he captured, he was the essence of a person who gave his life for other people. And so that's kind of our target and what we're shooting for. So the principles that we share with you today are all kind of designed to help us achieve this goal with with our family, with our kids. So why don't you share the first one? Yeah, the first thing that we discussed as we kind of sat down and said, well, what has it been over the last 18 years? What are some of the things that we have really tried to do or implement? The first principle is the idea that trust equals freedom. And that's simply to say that the level of freedom that our kids will enjoy in our home is directly equivalent to the level of trust that they have earned over time. Conversely, uh, when when they're making bad choices, their level of freedom will go down. If their level of trust goes down, also as their level of trust goes up, their level of freedom will go up. Uh, So uh, one illustration that I really like that stuck with me is from Dave Ramsey, and it's this idea that uh, as parents, we're in a boat on a body of water, and our child is in a life preserver with a rope attached to it, and we have the other end. And as they make better choices, they earn more trust, we can let that rope out and they can get a little bit further away from us and explore new areas and and have new experiences and make better choices. You give them a little bit more rope and they can venture out a little bit further. On the flip side, if you feel like things are going off the rails, you can kind of pull that rope back in and say, okay, let's do some more coaching. Let's, let's go over some things that we've discussed so that you can, you know, earn back some more freedom. Yeah, so this principle really comes from my childhood because all I ever wanted as a teenager was freedom. And I just wanted to come and go, watch what I wanted to watch, be who I wanted to be with. And I just saw my parents as the hindrances to my freedom. Anybody else? Like, you're stopping me from, you know, doing what I want to do. And so I figured that when we had kids, they would want to be free, as free as they could possibly be. And the ultimate goal is to give them freedom by leaving the house. And so we thought, well, how can, what scenario would occur where we could give our children as much freedom as they can possibly handle? Well, then we would have to trust them. We would have to trust that in any given situation that they're in with children in regards to alcohol or drugs or peer pressure to have sex or whatever it was, that they would be able to make the right decision under the pressure that they're under. And if we could trust that, man, you can have all the freedom that you want. And so that's really what we, what we strive for because ultimately they are leaving the house and they're going to have freedom either way. Mm-hmm. So sometimes you mentioned pulling the rope back. Sometimes parents tend to give away too much freedom that's really unearned and then they get themselves in a, into a little bit of a, 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 a pickle. How have we dealt with that? And what would you say to parents who have maybe given out too much rope? Yeah, well, what we've done because we have had those situations where we've given out too much, you just pull the rope back by taking away privileges. So the phone, screen time, video games, time away from home, time with friends, those are all some things that we have uh, taken away in an effort to help them have an opportunity to earn them back. As they demonstrate higher levels of trust, you earn back a privilege and continue to demonstrate a high level of trust, earn back another privilege. I think it's important to note though that we haven't taken away those privileges for like a set amount of time. Like, well, okay, you did this, now give me your phone for two days. Uh, because that doesn't necessarily correct the situation. They're not necessarily learning to make better choices during that time frame. So it's Give me your phone, and when this is different, when this is different, then we'll have a conversation about having the phone back. The one thing that I also love about this is that it it puts the responsibility for their freedom, as Danny mentioned, you know, my parents were all, you know, trying to make me miserable, always holding me back, keeping me from having fun. 
It's, it's not our responsibility. Your freedom is not our responsibility. It's yours. Mm. Your choices, your ability to demonstrate trust will earn you this level of freedom that you so desire. So if you're experiencing very little freedom, well, look at the history. And if you want more, then start making some better choices. I'm not trying to hold you back. Yeah, don't blame us for it. Don't point the finger at me. It's not my fault. Right. You're the one who made those choices. And so therefore, you lack, you're not going to experience the freedom that you desire. Mm -hmm. And so it puts, the, it puts the responsibility on them. Again, that's self-sustaining, self-sufficient, responsible people. That's what we're trying to produce in mm -hmm. the long run. Yeah, and the last thing that I'd point out is that it's never too late. If you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking, we've let the rope go, like, you know, things are kind of off the rails and we're beyond the point of no return. If your kids are still living in your home, it's not too late. It's never mm -hmm. too late. And that's where the church can partner with you. Each of our campuses has its own student ministries, Pastor. We have counseling services available that you can, can come alongside you and your family and try to work some of those issues out. Yeah, that's really good. That leads us to our second principle, which is the principle of wisdom. And this, this really answers the question of, well, how, do, how does the child or your, your child or our child earn trust? Well, the way they earn trust is to, pr is to practice wisdom and to grow in wisdom. You know, the book of Proverbs is one of my favorite books of the Bible, and it's really referred to as the book of wisdom. And it's written as a, from a father to a son. And it speaks extremely highly of this, of this principle of wisdom or this, uh, this character trait of wisdom. In one particular passage in Proverbs chapter 3, it says this, Joyful is the person who finds wisdom and the one who gains understanding. In Proverbs, wisdom and understanding are used synonymously. And essentially what, it, what that is, the, what wisdom is in the Bible, is the, uh, just basically the understanding of the way things work. The understanding of the way God's God's kingdom works, God's will, uh, what his will is, the, uh, how we work, how human beings are wired, how temptation works, how there, there are consequences for choices. Wisdom is basically just understanding of the way things work. So Solomon says joyful is the person who finds wisdom. Why? Because if, they, if a person knows how things work and they start making choices according to the way things actually work in the world... Their, their lives are going to fall into place and they're going to experience great relationships and they're going to have, you know, a clean conscience and they're just going to have a, a joyful life. And so he continues and says, for wisdom is more profitable than silver and her wages are better than gold. Imagine that. Wisdom is more important than having millions and millions of dollars. That's a huge statement. And then he says this to his son, wisdom is more precious than rubies and there's nothing that you can desire that is better than wisdom. And so I, I, I was kind of taken by that many years ago, like, wow, the most important thing we can have in this life is wisdom, understanding of God, understanding of the way things work. Well, if our children had that, we would be able to trust them because they would be able to make the right decision at the right time under the right pressure and we could extend them all kinds of freedom if they demonstrated wisdom. And so we gave them this definition of wisdom. I can't remember really where we got it from. Uh, but we pounded it into their heads like when they were really, really little. And if you ask any one of our children, they could quote it back to you. And this is essentially what it says. Wisdom is knowing the difference between right and wrong and doing what's right even when it's hard. Like if I can trust you to know what, to, what the right call is and to be able to do it under pressure... Dude, you can come and go as you please. You can have as much freedom as you, po you can possibly handle because you've demonstrated wisdom. So have you seen that kind of play out in our family? I think more recently, uh, you know, our oldest child is 18 now, and, and I've had over the last couple of years uh, friends who are moms of young children come to me saying, how do you handle this situation of curfew? You know, how are you guys handling that? And Honestly, in our home so far, it has just been rather than, you know, you better be home at 1130, and if you're one minute late, you're going to be in big trouble. It's just been an issue of, hey, when are you going to be home? Because he has earned so much trust through a series of wise choices that we trust him to be where he says he's going to be, with who he says he's going to be with, doing what he says he is going to be doing. And so no longer am I having to put that restriction on him. We're just telling him, you know, make some, you know, give us a, a good idea of when you're going to be home or maybe more often, can you please come home so we can go to bed because yeah. we're old. Because I'm tired. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
No, but that, I think that that has been a win. Now, I will say that it's not about fairness. I can't tell you that over the next few years that everybody else will be awarded that same level of freedom because it's, it's dependent upon each individual child and the trust that they have gained over time, the wisdom that they have displayed over time. And so it's not, oh, this one got a phone at this age, everybody else does too. It's no, you'll get a phone when we feel like we can trust you with a phone. Yeah, so in our home, it, it's not about fairness, and uh, that, that's, a, that's a tough one, especially if you, have, if you have multiple children or multiple siblings. You know, fairness is not, an, it is not a principle in our home because each person, each situation is dealt with on an individual basis based on your particular decisions, which are different from your sisters, different from your brothers, and so uh, we, we just don't play by that rule of fairness, and some of you parents need to write that down, no fairness. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I think the, the overarching or the theme there is that the foundation of trust is wisdom. Yeah. And so, you know, we can trust you more when you've displayed high amounts of wisdom. Yeah. So that kind of leads us to our third principle that we felt like uh, has been a, a theme in our family over many years, and that's the, the principle of unselfishness. Uh, when our kids were really small, we would have Bible time. And we wouldn't have it every night, but most nights of the week we would try to get after baths and showers and pajamas on, have maybe 15 minutes in one of the kids' rooms where we might read a Bible story and talk about how we could apply it to our lives. And and Danny would always have a Bible verse that the kids could be memorizing. And I know that uh, we had them memorize several different ones over the years, but the one that has, I think maybe had the most influence and really stuck with our family is Philippians 2 verse 4. We had the kids memorize this in the NIRV, which is a great translation for young children. And the verse simply says, none of you should look out for your own good. You should also look out for the good of others. It's real simple. And so we would have them memorize that, and then we're able to use it in a situation where, as siblings do, inevitably argue, fight, selfish, you know, wanting the same thing. We could just call a timeout and say, hey, what does Philippians 2, 4 say? And then, you know, one of them would kind of mutter it under their breath and all defeated and fine, they can have the remote control or whatever. Uh, but it, it was a great way to kind of, when we call the timeout and, and redirect or correct, to do it in such a way that, you know, right now you are not behaving according to what the Bible says. Instead of, you are not behaving in a way that makes my life easy, <laughs> which is really easy to do. You are behaving in a way that you're giving me a headache, and uh, I'm really annoyed with all of you right now, which is definitely the case sometimes, and I, probably, I know I've disciplined for that reason as well, but, but it's so much better for us to be able to say, hey, you know, time out. We're breaking God's law here. What does the Bible say? And let's, let's get back on track. Yeah, so I believe with all my heart that the quality of a person's life is really dependent upon the quality of their relationships. And so our desire is for our children to have great relationships when they grow up, great marriages. And based on what I've seen, and I don't have the evidence to prove this or the research necessarily, nothing destroys relationships faster than selfishness. I just believe that with all my heart. Divorces, uh, business, business partnerships fall apart, friendships fall apart because of this concept of selfishness. So we really try to push this out and we're really, we try to be strategic about this. Why don't you share a few ways of how we try to push selfishness out of our children's hearts and our family? Well, I mean, we try, but when you, when you, but the cereal is one area that we're still struggling. When you, when you have to write someone's name on the side of the box because they'll get offended if other people eat it, then I think we still have some, we Can still you? have some ground to cover. Maybe uh, but we're you still can share process. some positive examples okay. of we're, how we... We're a place of grace. We're all still in transition. Uh, no, but we do try to model it in our marriage, I think, is the first way that we can model it for one another. He made my breakfast this morning because I was still getting ready, you know. Um, he, last weekend when he was here, uh, when not here, he was at home ripping out the tile floor in our house because I had asked him to do that. He there we would, go. He would there we go. Talk about that. that. Talk about yeah. that. <laughs> talk about, talk about no, you did how good. my, my you back, did good. my yeah, back Yeah, he hurts. has the cuts on his hand to prove it. His back, his keep neck going. is really sore. Keep going, keep going. No, good to, you got some good husband <laughs> points. 
there. Uh, we try to model in our marriage. I think that's important. Um, serving at church, that has be- become a huge norm in our family. Uh, Years ago, our preschool was age divided into threes, fours, and fives, and for several years, I taught the fours on a weekly basis, and each one of my children, when they got in second or third grade, they would come alongside me, and they would assist. Instead of going to their own class, they would come in my class and help me until they were comfortable to kind of go out on their own. They've served in various places over the years, but they currently serve, Andrew serves in the third and fourth grade large group as a host. Uh, Bo, he's serving as a second grade boys small group leader along with some of his small group friends, so that's pretty neat. And Ruby serves in the toddlers and she's starting also to host in the preschool. And they really, really enjoy their areas of service. They get to serve with their peers, so they get another interaction with friends, and they also get to love on some kids, and they get to build relationships with these kids, and they look forward to seeing them on a weekly basis. So that, that has been fun, and I would just urge you that if your kids need a way to kind of get out of themselves and out of, you know, kind of the bubble that we all are in when we're young and teenagers, to put them on the impact team. Mm-hmm and get them into an area of service, and it doesn't have to be with kids. They can run the audiovisual equipment back there. There is definitely a place for everyone on the impact team, but that has been huge for us. Uh, We also did a family mission, a family service project a couple couple months ago. We went to Wheeler Mission, which is a local homeless shelter and ministry, and it was just great to put our hands on just a small fraction of what they do and kind of be able to see, you know, peek behind the curtain, see all the things they do for the under, underprivileged nearby in our community. And uh, then mission trips, those, ha- those have been, we did one as a family, Andrew and Danny got to go on one together, and they've just been a great way to uh, open their eyes to others. Yeah. So let's talk about this last one, principle number four, um, and that is, to, we're really passionate about this one. Maybe our, we're, this is probably the, the biggest one for us, is to guard, guard their hearts. And um, this actually comes from the book of Proverbs as well. Again, this is a Proverbs is written from a father to a son. And one of my favorite Proverbs is 4, verse 23, which says, you know, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. And essentially what that means is that the condition of our soul, that's the heart. When the Bible says heart, it's, it, it's a synonym for soul. And there's a couple of different parts to the soul. There's the mind, there's the will, there's the emotions. Of course, all of that, the body is involved in there because the soul is inside of the body. And Solomon is telling his son, hey, son, watch over your mind, watch over your emotions, watch over your appetites, watch over your choices, your will, because the condition of your soul determines the course of your life. In other words, we could say that Solomon is saying that if, if you allow me to see the condition of your soul, I can predict with some fair certainty where your life is headed. Does that make sense? Yes or no? Does that make sense? So while our children are in our home, and you know, I've got to practice this myself, and Jackie has to practice this, this applies to us too, not just our kids, but while they're in our home, it's our job to make sure that we are guarding their hearts. Um, Because again, the definition of parenting for us is, you know, to create these self-sustaining adults who are able to bless other people. And so if they're going to be able to do that, they need the right kind of character, the right kind of soul. And so we're a little bit over the top with this, and so we're going to share some ideas with you that we do in our home to protect their hearts. Uh, it, I'm not saying anybody else has to do this. We're probably hyper, you know, conservative on this, on this, on these issues. But it's because we understand that the, that that what what uh, what what comes into their eyes and what comes into their ears is shaping the condition of their soul, which determines the course of their life. So, why don't you share just some of the things that we do? Again, it's a little bit over the top, but it's just yeah. us. We are a little crazy about it, but. Um... I think it's okay to be crazy when it comes to, to some of these things that are very important. Um, we love movies. We are big fans of, of movies of all kinds. Um, but we like to vet the content uh, before we go to the movies or let something into our home. And so two of the websites that I are a go-to for me are commonsensemedia.org, uh, which um, tells you what, what you'll find. Uh, pluggedin.com by Focus on the Family will tell you exactly what you're going to hear and what you'll see in this movie before you go see it. So 
A lot of times my kids, happened last night, one of my kids texted me, hey, I'm, we're gonna watch this movie, is that okay? I did a quick search, yep, it's fine. And then, you know, they're good to go. Um, so that's one thing. The Circle is a Disney product that's a filter. I'm sure there are many other products that do the same thing. You plug it in, it connects to your wireless router. You can, you can filter the content that comes in. You can manage uh, screen time. You can sh totally shut off the internet if you need to, which, you know, if someone is playing video games for longer than they were supposed to, just through your phone, you can just shut it off. You know, and then real quick, they come in the room like, what happened to my video games? You know, um, so that, that, that doesn't ever happens in our house, never, right? No. Never, never. Um, our kids' screen time is with the, the phones. We all have iPhones, so through, and I'm sure Android has a capability like this. Through family sharing, I can monitor everybody's screen time. I can uh, put, again, filters, screen time limits, and I'm not, I don't do, awesome at this. It, all of these things takes a, a lot of work. It takes a lot of diligence because this, all the filters and stuff, they're kind of out of sight, out of mind. And so you might turn one off for a day for a particular circumstance and then forget, you know, and three weeks later, you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't put the filters back on, you know? So it takes a lot of work. It's a lot of diligence and we're not, definitely not perfect at it. Another norm that we've had in our house is just plugging the phones in at night in the kitchen rather than everyone taking them into their bedrooms until you have earned the freedom through many years of wise choices to take it to your room. Um, so a couple of our kids are still plugging them in in the kitchen and even with sleepovers. Like my children's friends know that when they come sleep over at my house at around 11 o'clock at night, I will say, hey guys, uh, text your mom, tell her good night, and I'm going to take your phone. <laughs> and we'll take them all upstairs. And uh, it's just another layer of protection that we, that we. And then we look we through have. your kids' phones and we're like, <laughs> wow. No, we don't. I'm just kidding, mom, dad, I'm just kidding. We no. don't look through your kids' phones. But I will say that kids, you know, while they were like long eye rolls and shoulder shrugs and sighs, you know, they don't act like they want boundaries, but deep down inside of them, there is a sense that they know that they need it and it gives them a sense of peace and security. And so I think when kids feel more safe, they they're have a better opportunity to make good choices as to when they feel like the wheels are off and, and they're spiraling out of control. So we create those boundaries to give them a sense of of safety and security. And honestly, it's okay to make your kid mad if the choice that you're making is keeping them safe. And that is a, that is a total, uh, an appropriate. That's a gem right there. Did you guys write that down? Woo, that's good preaching. Yeah. Not that you were preaching, no. you were sharing. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we're, we're constant, we're frequently making our kids mad. Yeah, can I just add something to that? You know, if, if you're not making your kids angry or frustrated on a regular basis, you're probably not parenting very well. That's, can I just say that? Can I? They are not, hey, listen, they are not your best friends. They're not even your close friends. They're your children. Yeah. Okay, so, you know. I think one, one place, too, where we're still, uh, we're, I th hopefully we're getting close, but is social media, just nobody has it right now, uh, and, our, and our, our kids don't have it right now, because I just feel like you're around your peers all day long. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be influenced by your peers all evening and all through the weekend until, you know, we have a little bit more of a stronger character and foundation, then we can enter into that realm. But right now that's just where we're at. And I think that they might be the only kids who don't have it. And they um, regularly remind us of that. Yeah, so. but that's just where we're at. And, and I just want to, you know, not, if, if, it's okay to be different and to be a little bit crazy if what you're doing, is, you feel like is a layer of protection. Yeah. You're good. I love you. <laughs> so this is all really hard work. And really what we're talking about is being engaged. And Jackie does a much better job of being engaged in what our kids are actually going through and what's, what's, what they're doing, what they're involved in. I try. I'm super busy. But the, the principle that I've seen, the truth that I've seen play out is that engagement really creates the accountability. Like, our, like Jackie mentioned a moment ago, like our children really want to know they want to be held accountable. They want to know that somebody cares and that, that, that somebody's watching out for their heart. 
what the, contents, the content that's coming through their mind and in their ears. Because of this today, the average, the average child sees hardcore pornography at 11 years old. You could, do re- you could do the research, 11 years old. It wasn't the case when we were kids, but it is today because of all the technology. So we have to be hyper-diligent to make sure that we're doing our best. We can't solve it all. We're going to miss stuff, but we're going to do our best to, to, to engage, mm-hmm. and that creates the accountability. And so yeah. maybe you're here today and you're a student, middle school, high school student, watching online, wherever you are, and you might be thinking, gosh, I don't have parents that care about my heart. I don't have parents that are teaching me wisdom. I don't have parents pushing the uns- helping to push the unselfishness out. I've got one mom and she's working all the time. Or I've got my dad. I'm a single, pa- my, my single home. He's always working. And I'm kind of, I've got all the freedom in the world that's really unearned. And I shouldn't even have this freedom. Maybe you're in a scenario like that. Here's what I would say to you. And I say this as a former youth pastor. I say, okay, maybe you don't have parents that are kind of watching over you and making sure all this stuff is happening. Guess what? You can practice it yourself. You can say to yourself, you know what? I've got a soul. I got to make sure it's healthy. I got to guard my eyes and guard my ears. I got to practice some of these things. I need to be wise. I need to know the difference between right and wrong and do what's right even when it's hard. I can't go along with my friends. I know I can't be selfish in this world, that selfishness destroys relationships. So I'm going to purposely do it myself and push the unsafe. Like you can take some of the stuff you heard today, even if you're a student and do not have parents that are working on this stuff, and you can implement it yourself. I just wanted to say that uh, to those you know, students out there that may be in that situation. Yeah. And I think the, to wrap everything up, uh, one really important possibly the most important point that we could make is all four of these principles fall underneath this umbrella, and that is that they're all biblical principles. They've all come straight from the Bible because it's our goal for, as individuals, to become more like Jesus. It's our goal to help our children learn to become like Jesus and live like Him. And uh, each one of the principles that we've we've shared, uh, they, they come from Him. He is the author of each one. He is the creator of each one. He is the source. So I suppose that a family could try to implement all of this without him, but it would be very hard because not only is he the source of the strategies, but he is the source of the strength to implement them and the love to to love our families with. Yeah, so maybe today you're here and, and, and you've not connected with the source. You've heard some good content, you know, help your kids be unselfish, you know, help teach them to be wise and, and all that, like Jackie just said. But the source of all of our parenting and the source of the, the strength of our marriage and our family is Christ. He is, the, he is wisdom. He is love. You know, we talk about being a person who's able to bless others. Jesus Christ gave his life for you. He died on the cross. He personified love. What is love? Love is doing what's best for other people. It's being others focused. And so maybe you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Christ, but you need one. You need everything we talked about today in your family, but you need Jesus first. He is wisdom. He is joy. He is peace. He is forgiveness. He is grace. You say, well, how do I, how do I get Jesus into my life? It's real simple. You ask him. You tell him that you believe in him. You tell him that you're ready to receive his love and his grace and that you believe he died on the cross for you. And you just express your faith to him and you say, will you please come into my life and save me and forgive me? And he will do just that. So maybe today you make that decision and you feel God tugging on your heart and say, man, I need this. I need joy. I need strength. I need peace. I need wisdom. I need courage to deal with my life and my children and my family and to get everything in line underneath his will. Maybe you take that step of faith today and you ask Christ to forgive your sins. You ask him to come into your life. If you'd like to do that, I'm gonna say a simple prayer. You take these words and turn it into your own prayer and talk to God and ask Christ to come into your life, forgive you and make you his child. If you feel led to, would you close your eyes and bow your head and just just do business with God if, if this is you right now? Just reach out in faith and say this to him. Dear Jesus, I turn to you. I reach out to you in faith. 
It's imperfect faith, but it's real. I believe you died in my place. I believe you sacrificed your life so I can be forgiven. So right now I just, I ask you to forgive me. Wash me of my sin. And fill my heart with your spirit, with your love, with your joy, with your peace, and with your strength. And from this day forward, teach me to follow you, to honor you, to love you, and to obey you. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, we want to celebrate with you. Amen. Come on, nice and loud, share it to all of our campuses together. If you, just, if you just trusted Christ, we would love for you to grab your phone right now and text the word SAVE to 65248. Here's why. We would love to put a box in your hands. It's a gift from us to you. And inside this box, the SAVE box, there is a Bible, a one-year New Testament. Uh, inside there, there's a reading plan. There's uh, some directions for your next steps on uh, your journey with Christ, how to get baptized, join a small group, join the impact team. And also there's a special cup in here. It's a coffee cup. And uh, I don't know why you would ever use it for anything else other than coffee, uh, because uh, it's a coffee cup. And anyway, it's a gift from us to you. And so if you trusted Christ, text that word SAVE to 65248 and grab one of these boxes in the back of the auditorium where you are. Has this been fun, guys? Amen.